Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dicaro. Um, you had some spoiler already for my talk uh, from the previous speaker. Yes. Um, and maybe before uh, starting uh, to introduce a little bit my research on the origin of life, origin of chirality, I would like to give a special thanks to Dicaro uh, who invited me. Um, I was here 10 years ago in Nara for an origin of life conference. Um, this was me 10 years ago. This is me two days ago, so I still fit yeah. through the pillar. So, which blessed me with 10 years afterwards. So, try it uh, tomorrow or during the next days. So, uh, try right, if you went through it, somehow it gives you luck and is blessing me. So, I'm still blessed. Um, so, our research is centered on the big question of origin of life. And to understand this question, you need to go back in time. Uh, when the Earth, four billion years ago, was covered by a lot of volcanic activity, the atmosphere was very hostile for actually uh, life to rose, but still, at this time, simple organic molecules started to assemble, build the first biopolymers, and give rise to the first uh, cells, which later on diverged in the three domains of life and all the complexity of life we have nowadays. So if, in my opinion, you would like to understand the phylogenetic tree, sorry, and use uh, um, all the different kind of life species, in my opinion, we have to look into the features that are common throughout the three domains of life. And I think most of you are very much aware about uh, zoos uh, biopolymers. So any living system, if you are a monkey, a plant, uh, a virus, uh, whatsoever, use nucleic acids to store genetic information, you use proteins that catalyze uh, very efficiently uh, chemical reactions, so the workhorses actually of every cell. You have the membranes to keep those uh, parts together. Membranes also have more even function, so they uh, are responsible to get rid of any waste and selectively introduce your nutrients in your, uh, in your cells. And then you have the force feature, which you heard already, which is biomolecular homochirality which are shared among all domains of life. And what I mean with uh, biological homochirality, if you look on the molecular level of those fundamental biopolymers, which are made up of, of the proteins, amino acids, using solady amino acids, solody amino acids incorporated. And if you look in the nucleic acids, you use one sugar molecule in the DNA, the deoxyribose, and RNA, the ribose which is already of the D configuration. And there's no <clears throat> good reason for this selection because if you look into the physical chemical properties of D and L enantiomers, they are the same. The only difference of chiral molecules in enantiomers is the way they interact with other chiral molecules and chiral life. So there is no good reason why life has chosen one enantiomer over the other. So I have a question. I, yes. I thought the peptidoglycan cell walls of bacteria actually had the oxygen. There are a few um, um, exceptions uh, of the D amino acids, and this research field is growing extensively, especially in Japan, to look into positive uh, functional uh, reasons for influence of D amino acids, but also to misfunction, especially in, in Alzheimer's disease and um, uh, cancer. So there's research going on. And in my opinion, at the beginning of life, both enantiomers were there. So this is why there is still some uh, remaining D amino acids for, for certain uh, biological function. But if you look in, in the proteins that uh, catalyze the reaction, those are considered to be exclusively of the L configuration. And if you integrate D, it, it's less good because the conformation will uh, certainly change and uh, reduce the efficiency of the uh, catalytic activity. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so if we now want to understand the origin of those chiral molecules, or oh, this is what I'm interested in, you could look, there are, there are scientists looking at the primordial zoo. However, if you look back in time, there was a, a harsh UV irradiation. So if you have some light uh, arising on those uh, prebiotic ponds, the risk to be destroyed by the harsh UV irradiation is pretty hard. So people came up with why not going in, in the deep sea, hydrothermal vents, preventing me from these harsh environments. You have those uh, hydrothermal vents, 
that uh, gives you nice energy. This is a, a hydrogen uh, dissociation in substance, but still you are in solution. So how you can polymerize is a huge question. And then there is a third big idea of why not having chiral molecules coming from extraterrestrial space, from solar system bodies. And why is that so? Is because if we look into meteorites, meteorites we heard already, meteorites are any stones that fall on the surface of Earth. Meteorites can have different histories. They can come from a comet or an asteroid. So from meteorites, we can learn a lot about the formation of the solar system and different environments of our solar system, which kind of reactions occur. And some of those meteorites contain organics, soluble organics. So if we extract those organics from those meteorites, we find actually a huge diversity of organic compounds and also compounds that are important for, for life, so amino acids and sugar compounds. And if we have a closer look to those chiral molecules, so amino acids and sugars, in terms of their enantiomer, here you have, this is called a two-dimensional gas chromatography uh, instrument covered with a kind of fly mass spectrometry, which I have in my life. Ba uh, lab. Basically, I have the first uh, GC column, which separates uh, my compound based on their volatility and chirality. And I have the second uh, column that separates uh, uh, due to the polarity. So it provides me a separation space, so enhanced resolution for complex mixtures. And this looks pretty beautiful and clean. This is not a standard, but comes from an extract of merges meteorite, which uh, fall on, on Earth in Australia. And if you see here, this is a, a abbreviation code of the amino acids, so alanine, valine, norvaline, leucine, and so on. And even maybe the people in the back could see that the L in answer, so the second debuting peak, is always a little bit higher. And so in the meteorites that have been analyzed for amino acids, we always see a slight excess of the left handed amino acids. So the left handed amino acid that is nowadays used in the proteins. So this is why we believe not only the amino acids came or could have been provided from outer space, but also the selection of the handles. So there are different ideas how this selection could have been occurred. There are random processes, some were already mentioned uh, previously. So crystallization, enantiomer selective synthesis on quartz, which are random processes. So gives you a 50-50 outcome and would on early Earth result in a random result. And then there are more directed uh, um, processes. And you heard already about circular polarized slide, and this is actually um, a mechanism we are working on. Why is that so? Because the circular polarized slide has been detected in molecular clouds. So in the outflows of uh, uh, new stars that are born in these molecular outflows, circular polarized light emission has been detected. It always comes as a quadrupole. So you have one big lobe with right circular polarized light, one big lobe as left circular polarized light, and you have two lobes here, also right and left. Those areas are very huge, more than 10 times larger than our solar system. So our solar system, born in those kind of molecular clouds, would have been evaded by solely one handedness of circular polarized light. Circular polarized light. For those unfamiliar, you have the electric field vector rotating perpendicular to the wave direction. And since it's rotating, you can imagine you rotate either clockwise or anti-clockwise. So this is why you have a, a defined left and right circular polarized light. It's a true chiral entity. Therefore, it can distinguish also between the enantiomers. And this is what is used often in circular diagrams spectroscopy. And this is also a reason but if you would irradiate a racemic mixture of uh, uh, chiral molecules, there is a slight difference in the absorption and extinction coefficients of those uh, two chiral forms. One will be destroyed faster than the other one, leaving an excess in the opposite enantiomer. So this is basically asymmetric photolysis based on the diaphoretic uh, extinction of circular polarized light. And because of this, differential absorption, which is basically circular diaphragm, we can derive with what is here called the anisotropy factor, which is the molecular anisotropy factor. Although there are different kinds of anisotropies around in different kinds of fields. We speak about the molecular anisotropy factor, 
which is basically the differential absorptions in the delta uh, epsilon over the non uh, 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 differential absorption, the overall absorption, and this gives you the net effect of circular polarized light on chiral molecules. In quantum chemical consideration, you can approximate the molecular anisotropy by the rotational and dipole strengths. So you can even calculate uh, this anisotropy factor. What we have done in the past is because we are interested mainly in amino acids for, for many years. Um, and amino acids in interstellar environments are not in solution. So what we have to do when we record those C here and anisotropy spectra, then we started uh, many years back to pre uh, prefer amorphous films. So this is similar to the CD spectra, except that in the, in the anisotropy factor, I divide the um, differential absorption by the absorption factor. Otherwise, it's quite similar to what uh, my previous speaker is, uh, is showed already. Uh, depending on the wavelength, and here you have l -anine. in blue is the l -anine. in red is the uh, d l -anine form, and so we've uh, um, produced amorphous films, so we do not do crystal, it's really uh, isotropic films that we afterwards uh, used to predict based, based on this equation, we could deduce based on those spectra, what we would expect if we perform asymmetric photolysis with amino acids. And we clearly see that the enantiomate itself is for sure depending on the wavelength, depending on the helicity. Those experiments have been um, in 2000, uh, my, my previous uh, uh, starting on, uh, on this experiment in 2010, we performed this at the Synchrotron Soleil that provided us actually the circular polarized light. So we started with racemic films of alanine, irradiating it with left or right circular polarized light. And so depending on the helicity, we either had an excess of the L or the D in maximum, which was totally in line with our prediction of the anisotropy spectra. Very recently, we enlarged this research to isovalene. Isovalene is very special for the chemists chemist and meteorite chemist because isovalene is a non-biological amino acid. We are often criticized uh, that if in meteorites you find an excess of the L form in alanine, leucine, and any biological compound, ah, you can be sure that it's not a contamination. So this is why isovalene is always a kind of showcase to say, hey, this is, uh, is very rare on Earth. And if it exists in some of the bacteria, it's mostly in the D form. And so this is why we started to work on isovalene because it also has a very high enantiomic excess, in, uh, especially aqueous altered meteorites. And so what we have done is we looked into the data. So here you have plotted the aqueous alteration of those meteorites. So the more meteorites or the parent bodies of meteorites, the asteroids, are aqueous altered, the higher is the EB. So there is always this question how this amplification uh, mm -hmm. grows. Is this something maybe uh, uh, um, amino nitriles? Are actually uh, uh, the precursors and doing aqueous alteration, they are amplified, or what is the mechanism of, of those amplification? So, we performed um, those anisotropy spectra for isovalene, which was a little bit tricky. Uh, I, we can discuss this later on if someone is interested. We, we, uh, we got very nice spectra. Uh, nowadays, I have a laser in my lab, so I don't need to go to the synchrotron anymore. At least if I go down to 119 nanometers with my OPO laser, otherwise I, I still have to go to the synchrotron. I cannot uh, uh, work below this wavelength. We have a soleil Barbier compensator. So depending on the energy that, that I have to work with, we can uh, get circular polarized light in this given wavelength. So we performed those photolysis experiment, similar to what I told you to uh, Eleni, and it was the same. We got uh, anatomic excess in isovalene depending on the velocity. And in this case, the anatomic excess was very low of 2%. And if I simply go back on this slide, this explains why the least aqueous altered meteorites contain such a small excess, which wouldn't violate with the theory of circular polarized light, but the excess induced by circular polarized light is very little and would require an amplification already on the X-ray parent body. 
Um, yes. So I um, I told you that we worked on this amorphous films because we thought that to best we produce those interstellar environments where there is no liquid water, uh, we should we should uh, uh, remove the water shell. For sure, this is a very simple approximation. You can also have chiral molecules in the gas phase, but most of all, uh, they are surrounded in, a, in water ices. So in the future, I don't have results currently on this. This is a, a proposal that I currently brought up to investigate amino acids and other chiral molecules in those amorphous water ices. What we have done in, uh, so far is to look into the amorphous structures, but also recently in the gas phase, because one amino acid has recently be, uh, been detected uh, during the Rosetta mission. Rosetta mission was a mission following uh, in a comet and uh, uh, looked into uh, different kind of uh, properties um, of the comet and uh, lysine, the simplest uh, amino acid, was detected in uh, uh, in the coma of uh, um, this comet. And this inspired us to look into what are the chiroptical properties of gas phase amino acid. For sure, the, uh, if you remove the water shell, um, neutral amino acids um, are not switter ionic anymore, but in the, in, uh, in the neutral state. Um, and this was uh, uh, basically uh, allowed, or, or Zoom studies was allowed, building this kind of uh, gas chamber uh, to, to record the spectra. I don't want to go in much detail what we have done in the past. We investigated this chiroptical properties in different kinds of states of matter in a solid state in the gas phase, um, varying pH, varying complexation, so what would be the in, uh, influence of ions. And uh, basically, the, the result is that the chiroptical properties are very much dependent uh, on the environment, uh, which is logical if you uh, think back on what defines the G, the rotation and dipole strength that we can easily influence uh, by conformational change and by uh, uh, the, the dipole moment of the surrounding environment. I brought you one example, which is propylene oxide. Uh, propylene oxide is the simplest chiral molecule that has been detected in interstellar space gave a big buzz uh, in, in, the, in the community. However, we don't know if there's an excess of the R or S uh, in Langsumer in space, but it was still a, a, big, uh, a big announcement in the community that the first chiral molecule propylene oxide has been detected. When we looked a little bit in the literature about this uh, compound propylene oxide, has also been detected in meteorites with an excess of the R in Langsumer. So for sure, we were interested in what would be the interaction of propylene oxide with circular polarized light. We had already our gas chamber for the amino acid studies, so it didn't took us uh, too much time. So this is the CD spectra of this propylene oxide. What is really nice here, you have the anisotropy spectra that because it, it's a very rigid molecule, it has no conformational freedom, so it, it's really just one conformer which uh, allowed also a journey makes a calculation for it. So we have even vibrational resolved tra tra uh, transitions, which is really rare in CD anisotropy uh, spectroscopy. And with those uh, spectra, we, what we have done is we waited over the entire anisotropy spectra, imagining that circular polarized light in space would not be monochromatic that is a polychromatic uh, uh, wavelength. So what would be the net effect if um, propylene oxide would be irradiated by broad metal circular polarized light in space? And what we uh, found out is that if propylene oxide would be irradiated with net circular polarized light, we would get an excess of the R enantiomer. So the R enantiomer, which has been found in excess in mitra, which leads us to the conclusion that if our solar system has been formed, it may have been likely been irradiated, illuminated by left circular polarized light. Um, and then I still have a few minutes left. So we, what I have shown you so far is that we um, work a lot on the chiroptical uh, uh, properties of chiral molecules to understand the interaction of them with circular polarized light. What we also try to do in the lab is to understand 
the formation of those chiral molecules in intercellular ices, intercellular environments uh, in general. And I don't have uh, too much time to go in detail here. But what we have is we have well, a kind of space simulator uh, simulating intercellular environments to create those intercellular molecules. So then the, those uh, intercellular ice experiments uh, are performed throughout the world nowadays. So what we what we do, we work at very low pressures, very low temperatures, so getting as similar rich to astrophysical environments. In most of the experiment currently, we work with water, ammonia, and methanol molecules that have been detected in molecular environments. And we either um, irrigate them with UV light, often lime and alpha as the most dominant irrigation source in uh, molecular clouds, or we also use uh, electrons uh, simulating cosmic rays, the secondary electrons uh, uh, produced by those cosmic rays, and perform those experiments uh, for several days. After those uh, um, uh, production of intercellular ices, we heat up those ices and we analyze them Again, this is multidimensional gas chromatography technique in our lab. And we have shown that starting from ammonia water uh, methanol, so non-chiral uh, uh, non precursors, no CC bond in the system initially, that we can create uh, complex molecules, such as uh, sugar molecules. Ribose, for sure, stood out a little bit in the story, and this is a sugar use in the RNA. We have performed many of those experiments. What we always try to do is that we uh, label the methanol in our system with carbon-13 to convince us that we uh, produce those molecules in the system and for sure to please the referees of our publications to really show that this are not contamination but really coming from our interstellar ice experiments. What we have done so far is that we, we show that sugars can be uh, formed in those environments a Japanese team showed that also nucleobases are abundant in those intestinal ices. Amino acids have been uh, detected in those ices. And recently, in the collaboration with uh, Hawaii, we saw that even uh, lipid precursors uh, can be easily formed in those ices. So actually, all building blocks that you need can be easily created in, in those uh, environments. The, the next step was to look into those ices to create those ices, replacing the non-polarized non -polarized light with circular polarized light, and look at would we be able to create amino acids, but this time maybe with an enantiomeric excess. And this is actually what happened when we produce those ices with left circular polarized light, we get an excess of the uh, L enantiomer of the amino acids. This is the control experiment of linear polarized light where we have a racemic uh, distribution. If we use right circular polarized light, we get an excess of the opposite enantiomer. So this also shows that asymmetric photosynthesis is available in those env environments. And what we are doing at the moment is that we worked for many, many years on amino acids. We have a good understanding of what's going on with amino acids. Amino acids have been a million times uh, detected in, in vitro. So we are now interested in sugar molecules after our detection of those sugar molecules in those intercellular ices. So we simulated uh, astrophysical samples. Uh, some research uh, uh, researchers in, in Japan recently, for the very first time, detected new sugar molecules in the extracts of meteorites. You see that. The resolution is very poor, um, and there's no enantiomer resolution. So for now, we do not know if sugars contain an excess of the enantiomer. This is something we are currently uh, working on. So what we have done is we have developed an entire extraction fractionation protocol for those extraterrestrial samples. We have developed enantiomer selective resolution tools using our multidimensional gas chromatography. And here you just see the isovalent, very nice resolution. So if we have now those extraterrestrial samples, we will be able to distinguish and to quantify those two enantiomers. And here on the right, we have um, very recently managed now to have those kind of very beautiful enantiomer resolution also for sugar molecules. Because sugar molecules 
I don't have the time uh, to go in much detail, but sugar molecules are very awful in analytic chemis chemistry because in textbooks you always find them as a linear structure, but this is not the reality. They form ring structures and they can try, uh, form five or six membered rings, alpha or beta pyramids. So one single um, sugar has actually five different isomers in solution, and this is for sure uh, getting more complex uh, chromatograms and reducing uh, the sensitivity in the system. So we have now uh, got some uh, nice uh, resolution data on sugars as well. And the very next step is that I don't know because I'm not in Japan. So most of you, I think, heard about uh, those uh, sample return missions from asteroids. So there was one mission from uh, the Japanese space agency, JAXA, who brought back uh, samples from the Wu, um, in 2020. <clears throat> and last year, uh, the NASA uh, uh, led space mission Osiris Rex brought back even more samples from an asteroid. Mm -hmm. And we are currently having samples from uh, Rivu in our lab. I can tell you it's 17 milligrams, so it's very few sample amount. And our uh, goal is now to look into amino acids and sugars in, in these samples. And maybe at the next meeting, I can tell you that sugars contain in excess of the D in maximum. This would be amazing. <laughs> Um, and maybe future trends, what we are, because we developed for many, many years now all these uh, protocols, so we will look for sure uh, into the amino acids and sugar uh, access in Rigu samples, but also other meteorites. And for sure, I'm also, but I didn't have the time uh, to speak about this, looking into the chiral amplification, because what you have seen, the uh, enantiomeric excess uh, based on the circular polarized light is very poor, so there has to be some amplification. And I'm also not too narrow minded to think that circular polarized light would be the only source. There are different kinds of uh, theories around. We worked already on minerals, and I would also love to work with spin polarized electrons, but I have some difficulties to do this in the lab, so I would be happy if someone is interested to work with me on that. So um, these are a little bit future strategies, and this is, I would like to thank my team, some of the collaboration partners from the Simplicon Soleil, uh, Ralf Kaiser at Hawaii. It's a really nice collaboration. I visited him uh, two weeks ago, so I spent some time on Hawaii, so they can be worse collaboration partners. Um, and for sure, I thank the funding agencies who allow me to dream about the origin of life and the asymmetry of organic molecules. Thank you.